Okay. Ah, we sound good to go. Okay, I, I'm going to tell you about something completely different, right? Maybe, maybe something you haven't heard before, but something that clearly impacts your lives every day, right? And, and in fact, it's going to impact your life enormously over the next several years. And, and how algae has something to do with that, well, maybe at the end you'll, you'll understand, okay? So, but I'm going to tell you about food and fuel for the 21st century. So we better start with the basics, which is, you know, why food and fuel together? Why are these things even in the same sentence? The easiest way to think about this is they're both chemical energy. They're both essentially the same thing. So chemical energy is the energy in a substance that can be released by a chemical reaction to do work. So what does that mean? That means I can put a gallon of gasoline in my car and I can drive down, down the street to the store. Or I can put a slice of pizza in me and I can hop on a bike and ride down there. So in both of those, I've taken chemical energy and I've converted it to mechanical energy, right? But we also interconvert between these things, right? It's not just that they're both chemical energy, it's that we actually exchange between them. So they're two sides to the same coin. So food energy, anyone in this room eats about 2,000 to 3,000 calories per day, and we burn about 40,000 calories of gasoline on average for an American every day. And one gallon of gasoline is about 31,000 calories. One bushel of corn is 84,000 calories. And one bushel of corn equals 2.8 gallons of gasoline. Why do I say that? I say that because in 2014, last year, we took 40% of our corn crop in the United States and we converted that to 14 billion gallons of ethanol and we put that 14 billion gallons of ethanol into our gasoline. If you go down to the gas station here in La Jolla, right down at the bottom of the street, and get a gallon of gas today, that will have 5% corn ethanol in it, as does every gasoline in the United States. Some actually have higher, 7.5% to 15%, to depending upon where you are. So we quite literally take food and turn it into fuel. We do the opposite as well, but we do that indirectly, right? That's something called the Green Revolution that started about 60 years ago, first here in the United States and then in Mexico, in which we intensively bred plants to be very high yielding, right? And we had an enormous success on this. If you look at any criteria, this happens to be wheat in India, and between 1960s and 2010, we had a threefold increase in yield in those. In some, like corn, we had a fivefold increase in yield over that time. But we didn't do that by increasing the number of farms or the acres planted, and we didn't do it by increasing the number of farmers. In fact, those went down a little bit. We did that by enormously increasing the number of tractors, by increasing the amount of fertilizer, which are also made from fossil fuels, and by, and by increasing the amount of energy that we put into transporting food around the world. So we quite literally exchanged fossil fuel for increase in food. And that worked really well, right? We have 7.3 billion people on the planet today because of this. And for many years, fossil fuel was cheap enough that this was simply not an issue, right? We could convert very cheap fossil fuel into very cheap food, and that allowed the world's population to explode. But because over time, as we increase the amount of energy into food, and that energy went in, as I said, in mechanized agriculture and the use of tractors, but also in transporting food around the world and in the chemicals, fertilizers that go into it, because of that, energy became such a large component of food that it now dominates the cost of food. And in fact, this graph plots the food price index against the average oil price from 2001 till today. So prior to 2001, so only 15 years ago, prior to 2001, the average cost of a barrel of oil was less than $20 a barrel. In fact, for most of the time since World War II until today, it averaged $8 a barrel. Okay? But as more energy went into food, these things became very tightly linked. And I can think you, you can see there's a very good correlation between these two. So why is that important? Why does that impact the world? That impacts the world because here's the food price index of 100. Okay, that's an arbitrary number, and this is just averaging the price of corn, the price of beef, the price of beans, you name it. Just all in, the average price was set to be 100%. And it sort of drifted up and down around that. But as the price of energy went up, the price of food went up. So why is that a problem? That's a problem for the world because 2 billion people on the planet 
spend at least 50% of their income on food. And one billion people on the planet spend 70% of their income on food. And I think you can do the quick math. If, if the food price index was 100 and it went up to 220 and you were spending 70% of your income on food, well, now you're spending well over your income on food. And that's a problem. That's a serious problem for the bottom 2 billion people. It's not a problem for people in this room because we spend on average about 8 or 10% of our income. But it's a problem for the bottom 2 billion people. And when there's a problem for the bottom 2 billion people, that becomes a problem for us. OK, so you can read in the papers today, right? And in fact, if you Google it and look up peak oil, you can find articles today that will tell you, we haven't hit peak oil. We're going to produce more fossil fuel than ever. This is a graph of oil production over the last 10,000 years. Okay? We really started in earnest in 1900. We hit peak oil in 2007. We can measure these things. Right? We haven't hit peak hydrocarbon, all right? but we hit peak oil. What is peak oil? Oil is the liquid fossil fuel that we drill holes in the ground and pull it out. That's the easy, cheap stuff to get. The stuff we are pulling out of the ground now, the stuff we are discovering out of the ground now is very deep. It's things like the tar sands or shale oil or some of the thick sulfur oils from Venezuela. These are very expensive to get out of the ground. Today, oil was $42 a barrel. A year ago, it was $100 a barrel. People look at that and they say, well, if the price of oil is $42 a barrel, we're going to be in great shape. It's going to keep right on going down. It's not going to keep going down, all right? This is, this is the Saudis having enough of the frackers and turning the spigot on, but they're going to turn it off very soon. But why is this graph, you know, 10,000 years, why pick that? 10,000 years is a completely arbitrary scale here. It took 300 million years for fossil fuel to accumulate on this planet, okay? If I put this on a 300 million year time scale, you would not see this, right? I could have also put this on the time scale for how long have humans been on the planet, maybe a million or a million and a half years. Again, you wouldn't even see that. What this is simply showing you is that we are going to burn through 300 million years of accumulated fossil fuel in eight generations of people. That's a significant problem. But this is the graph that really defines why this is a problem for all of us in this room and for everyone on the planet. So this is that same oil production over the last 10,000 years. And then what I did was I overlaid on top of it world population for the same time. Right? And if you look at these two things, you can see that there's a pretty good correlation between these two. And this relates back to the slide I showed you on industrial agriculture. We took cheap fossil fuel and with some very clever plant breeding, turn that into really cheap food, and that allowed the world population to grow to 7.2 billion people. But going forward, we no longer have cheap fossil fuel. And that means we no longer have cheap food. So the real question is, what do we do going forward with the 2 billion people who can't afford to feed themselves today when the price of food is likely to go up? This is an enormous challenge, right? And this is actually what I'll tell you about today. So many people can say, well, yeah, but the price of food has gone up, but, but why is this a problem for us, right? We have enough money, United States, Europe, even China, we have enough money to buy food. Why, why is this a problem for us? This is a problem for us. This is ISIL, right? This is the Islamic State. The Islamic State is a response to, I can't afford food anymore. Here is that same food price index, the one that I showed you in blue before, and then overlaid on top of it, the food price index overlaid, overlaid with significant riots in the Middle East and North Africa. And what really jumps out at you here are these ones right here, Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. This is the beginning of what's called or referred to as the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring had nothing to do with democracy. It had to do with the fact that food that was subsidized in Egypt and Libya when the price of bread got too high and the governments could no longer subsidize food, they stopped that. People couldn't afford to eat. They rioted. And then those riots morphed into a democracy movement. If you can't afford to feed your family, the problem must be with your government. So what did they do in Egypt? They threw out Mubarak. And in came the Muslim Brotherhood. But the Muslim Brotherhood had no, they had no money. They had no way to, to subsidize food back to a reasonable level. So in very short order, they threw out the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Now the Egyptian military is in there. They would throw out the Egyptian military, except they have all the guns, so they can't throw them out. But it hasn't solved the problem. This is the fundamental problem. I look at what's going on in the Middle East now, and the irony there is that they took their fossil fuel reserves, sold those on the open market, and bought food, and allowed their populations to explode. The populations in Saudi Arabia went from 4 million residents 50 years ago to 32 million today, with no increase in the ability to produce food. They could barely feed 4 million people 50 years ago. They have 32 million people today and no increase in agriculture. How do they get by? They sell oil on the open market and buy food from us and from Brazil and from Russia and from the rest. But they haven't increased the critical resource, which is food, right? So this is the real problem. This is the problem that we face, and it's real today. This is not something imagined that's going to come in the future. OK, so that gets me to the point of my talk. OK, should we, should we all just give up? You know, Is it just like, well, there's too many people on the planet. We're going to have to get rid of some of them. We'll let a few wars sort these things out. Today, we can actually make discoveries so fast in the lab. It's phenomenal. The project that I did at UC Berkeley that I was awarded a PhD for, which was cloning a gene and characterizing it, is done by high school interns in two or three days in my lab now, right? And part of that maybe is because high school interns are smarter today than I was 30 years ago. But most of it is because that's how fast technology has, has advanced, all right? So we have an opportunity to do this, but we have to look at new and different things. All right. So I'm going to tell you about some of the things that I do, some of the things that I do with algae. But why do I do them with algae, and why do we care about that? There's one really important part of it. These are aquatic organisms that contain chlorophyll and carry on photosynthesis. All right, who had photosynthesis in their class? Oh, not even as many have gone to the aquarium. This is really bad. This is the most important reaction on the planet. Fish are important. I'll give you that, and the aquarium is beautiful. But this is more important. You guys have to know this. You, you have some of these beautiful things in the aquarium, and we'll talk about it for sustainability. OK, so here's the important reaction. Food and fuel, all of our food and 85% of our fuel comes from this reaction. What is this reaction? This reaction is sunlight and CO2 makes primary sugars, and those primary sugars get converted to carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. You clearly recognize those as, as food. What you maybe don't recognize is that petroleum is fossil algae and coal is fossil plants. That means all of the hydrocarbons we burn today came from this reaction. It just came from this reaction a million years ago. So what are we going to do? We're going to do in real time, we're going to take these little guys and using photosynthesis, we're going to make a variety of products. It would be great if we could make fuel. These are pictures from my lab. We grow the algae, we concentrate it, we separate it into the protein, carbohydrates, and lipids. And the lipids, believe it or not, because petroleum comes from algae oil, we take those lipids and we send them to oil refineries and we can break those into gasoline and diesel. We can already do this now. And in fact, the one of the companies that I started called Sapphire Energy did exactly that and they drove this little car around, the Algeas. Half algae, half Prius. Not Algeas. Some people call this Algeas. It is not that, Algeas. And, and one of our competitors, Solazine, made diesel and drove boats around. So we can do this. Why don't we do this today? Is because we cannot compete with fossil fuel at $40 a barrel. We have to wait for the price to come back up to 100 and then we can compete. But in the meantime, between now and then, we can make lots of other things. Here's one that I made in my lab. This happens to be called mammary-associated amyloid. It's a little protein that comes from milk or colostrum. And when you eat that protein, it goes through your stomach, gets into your intestine, stimulates your intestine to secrete mucin, and that mucin protects you from bacterial or viral infections. Why is that important? That's important because this little guy right here, this little pig, about 15% of them get bad bacterial diarrhea and die. It's called Scour's disease in agriculture. So we've done studies to show that we can actually protect pigs by feeding them algae that is expressing that protein. Why is this important for us? If we could prevent or reduce diarrhea, bacterial diarrhea, that kills 5 million kids every year. It's the number one killer of children on the planet. It's not starvation. It's not malaria. It's dehydration from bacterial diarrhea. And we think we have now a way to intervene in this. OK, I'm going to leave you with one last totally cool product that we can make. And as I said, petroleum is simply f f fossil algae oil. That means anything we can make from petroleum, we can make from algae. So we're here at UC San Diego. What's the most important product you could possibly make as a petroleum replacement? Polyurethane. 
Polyurethane. Yes, polyurethane. So how do you make polyurethane? You start with a fatty acid. These have double bonds. Through an epoxidation reaction, a ring opening, you make hydroxyls. Hydroxyls are reactive. Once you have a reactive hydroxyl, you take that in a crosslinker, and you can make polyurethane. And what do you make with polyurethane? You make surfboards. <laughs> that is Mike Burkhart. He's an organic chemist here. Mike and I got together and made the world's first polyurethane surfboard blank. And then in collaboration with Arctic Foam, we made the world's first algae surfboards. And Earth Day this year, we gave one to Kevin Faulkner. He's the mayor of San Diego. Kevin took that surfboard all around the world and then irresponsibly gave it to the president of Japan Airlines because they had opened a flight between Tokyo and San Diego to promote biotechnology. And Kevin said, this is the coolest biotechnology I have ever seen. Then he got back and called me up and said, I need another one. <laughs> so we made another one for him, and he's got it. That happens to be Rob Machado. He's a, he's a surfer here in town. Uh, and Rob and I presented it to Mayor, and that's Marty Gilchrist, he's president of Arctic Foam. So we can make anything we want in these little guys. And certainly surfboards is a really important one to make. These things are sustainable, they're carbon neutral, and they're biodegradable. And we're going to go into production of these things in early 2016. So what does that mean? What are we going to do with algae? Ultimately, we would really like to make fuel. And if we can make fuel, if you solve the energy problem, you solve every other problem on the planet. You solve food, you solve climate change, you solve it all. But that is a very tough nut to crack. That is going to take us a long time. So in the meantime, we're going to make high value products, right? which people will pay for, because that surfboard is about 700 bucks retail, and we only increase the cost of it about $7 by making that of algae. So something surfers can certainly afford. Eventually, we'll get to making foods, and then finally, we'll make fuel. And when we get to this point, we have a good chance. Our biggest challenge, believe it or not, is not the technology to do this. It's the social acceptance to this. It's are people willing to pay 1% more for a surfboard that is sustainable? Surfers are, but would you pay 1% more for gasoline? Not everybody will, right? So it's actually social change that we need as much as technology change, OK? So I'm going to end it right there and just tell you that we are CalCab here at UC San Diego. We are always looking for student volunteers to come in and work on totally cool projects. You can come and make a surfboard. You can come and make a malaria vaccine. Or if you want, you can come and make biodiesel. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>